I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic cast from Inventing Anna. We're joined today by Julia Garner, Anna Klumski, Laverne Cox, Katie Lowe's, Alexis Floyd, and Ariane Moyad. And Julia, I wanted to start by talking about a lot of the, the, the dialect work that you did for this character, because it's so fascinating in that you're playing a character who has a multitude of, of dialects in the way that she speaks, you know. She has the fact that she grew up in Russia, that she moved to Germany, the American influence of watching a lot of television from there, and then the fact that she's coding and trying to avoid allowing the Russian inflections to come out, but they obviously seep to the surface at certain moments. And then the tone of her voice, which has a real lightness to it, but sometimes goes into like the deeper spaces when she's feeling antagonized. And so I was really fascinated by, by the dialect work that you did to find that very specific accent for her, but also how you also then carried that through in utilizing a lot of different tones in your performance? Well, you know, the, the dialect was really important with um, just f even with finding the character because they're, you know, Anna's a very like private person and doesn't love to give a lot of information about herself. But to me, the dialect is really somebody that is trying to be something that they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's also what the show is about, too. It's about identity. Um, but but I feel like the, the it, 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 because this is somebody who was born in Russia, but convinced people that she was German. So she clearly doesn't sound Russian because people believed her enough that she was German. So the first thing that I had to learn was a German accent, you know, was a German accent is like much more um, subtle. And it's a, I don't know, they don't sound I don't want to say they don't sound excited, but it's like vocal fry at the end of everything right um but then certain like oh anything with an l all mm -hmm. is like oh kind of russian so then you kind of have this weird in between like certain words for example that's kind of russian a little very subtly okay. subtly and then you know she moved to new york and her accent got mm -hmm. americanized so mm -hmm. Americans, like musically, the accent is like an American. So if you notice, like Americans, they it sounds like they have a question at the end of everything. Europeans are just much more matter of fact, like, mm -hmm. you know, but Americans are kind of like, like, I'm really happy. Like, I'm really happy, you know? So, it, so I wanted her to sound <laughs> like, <laughs> I wanted her to sound like that if she was in Europe, she would sound American to her European mm -hmm. friends. When she was in Euro America, she would sound your like, you know, so it's a different hybrid of accents. Um, so that was the main thing for me to really get to know Anna. Um, Again, because this is a, a woman who's trying to be something that she's not. And it comes down with how she speaks. So, yeah, it's very confusing. There's not a simple answer. It was, it's probably the hardest accent I will ever do. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and you did an amazing. Amazing job. Yeah, yes. I, I was like, no, it's, it's been kind of tricky explaining this to people. Like, where's the accent? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I don't know, but it's, yeah, it's crazy. And, and jumping over to you, Anna, with, with your character, Vivian, you know, one of the things that's so impressive to see in her adeptness at the way that she approaches her work is, you know, she's she's going and meeting with all these different characters throughout the series and trying to convince them to be part of a story and they're all resistant and it's about how she kind of wins them over. And through the way that you're playing Vivian, we see that you create a different type of space for them. The way that she talks to Anna when she visits her at Rikers is very different to the way that she's trying to convince Todd to let her see discovery on the case or, or give her any information or the way that she's talking to Laverne's character um, and so when you were going through the scripts and, and thinking about all these different characters that you're you're um, interacting with in that way and trying to sway over to your side, how did you find those different elements of, well, what does the other character want and what does my character need to give them in terms of the space that she's creating? Uh, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought that up. It, it just started making my wheels turn about like, you know, more dramaturgy about our show. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, it's true. We all, we all switch and have different facets depending on what we want to get from each other. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's not just Ann Delvey who does that, right? She just does it really, really specifically and really, really well. Um, but yeah, I, 
this is this is the benefit of acting technique where you know i i like to go scene by scene um and you know you analyze the scene and what you want from your scene partner um and when we're blessed with great writing um that is that is kind of built in to the analysis um what you what you witnessed um as an audience member gratefully is um is really um you know my responding and and doing my job with with the text mm -hmm. um because it, yeah every 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 scene between different characters has to reflect who those characters are and how they would speak to each other and that's something that our writers and shonda are are so gifted at um and yeah it's it's just my job to to make sure i i try my damnedest to get it <laughs> as vivian no, you, you absolutely did. And Laverne, with your character, um, I was interested in in how you found the specific energy of her because she's so keyed into and constantly talking about energy, kind of reading other people's energy, you know, and she's kind of one of the people that gets those spidey senses of like something doesn't feel right and this is someone that I don't want to have close to me, um, you know, and because she's always trying to have that positive outlook, when she is in situations with Anna where she's very antagonized and she's trying to create boundaries, um, I was interested in, in the performance aspect in those moments because it's still expressing her anger, expressing her frustration, but still kind of keeping the essence of her core of who she is the rest of the time as well. I think with Casey, when I, when I met with, often when I um, approach a character, um, Susan Batson, my acting mentor has this, it's not her concept, but she talks a lot about the character's tragic flaw. And, and the way she defines the character's tragic flaw is the tension between the character's unfulfilled need and their public persona. And so when I met with Shonda, I often start with a character's flaw because that's often what I feel that you can play. And so I asked Shonda what she thought Casey's tragic flaw is. And it's a strange thing to you know, sort of say about a person who you admire and respect and who's walking around. But um, I think there's something very genuine in Casey that she really wants to help. She really wants to help. There's a moment in the interview that um, the, that um, Casey does with the writer's room where she, even as she's telling the story, she's like, you know, if I had a little more time with Anna, I think I could have helped her. So that there was something very sincere, almost to a fault about Casey, about really wanting to be of service, really wanting to be there for people and help people. And, you know, I had the privilege of sitting down with Casey Duke for, um, we did, I had a four hour lunch. I trained with her multiple times. She told me her mm. life story. And so I think that, that what is, what colors so much of, um, there's kind of conflict in that, but particularly that scene when um, Anna is sort of in the lobby, you know, and Casey's upstairs, you know, trying to get her groove back, if you will, <laughs> and ends up, you know, sort of siding <laughs> with Anna and in wanting to in needing to to be a service, and also not when Anna sort of threatens suicide. <laughs> spoiler alert! It's this thing that Casey didn't want to sort of have on sort of be responsible for. So there's this thing that, that's very genuine for Casey about wanting to be of service and wanting to help people, and sometimes that um, is taken advantage of, um, obviously. Um, but I think um, of all the people, you know, watching the series, I think of all the people who were in Anna's life, I, I would say that Casey, I would suggest anyway, maybe I'm biased because I play Casey, that she had the, and she had changes that were the most pure. She was doing a job. She wanted to be of service. I don't think that she was ever had a space of using Anna. I think that a lot of people used Anna and had an agenda around her. And I think that, that their agendas that were not necessarily allowed them to be swindled, allowed them to believe the lies that Anna um, presented to them because they had their own agendas that um, were ultimately about using it as well. And that they had that agenda. I think that's a great point. And, and Alexis, for your character with Neff, it's, it's really interesting because she starts out with an agenda and then the agenda becomes very secondary. Um, and, and how did you want to shape the dynamic with Julia differently in those two moments at the beginning where it's, you know, it's all about her dream of filmmaking, getting those tips and, and really kind of using her prowess professionally. And then when you have that tipping point and that shift and, and just what it means to Neff to have someone look at her and acknowledge her in that way, particularly in a workplace where she 
she spends most of her working hours and people just look straight past her all the time. Yes, that's it. It's that moment when, you know, Nef, I sort of think of her as the keeper of the keys, but she rarely has the opportunity to use any of them. And then when Anna says, do you want to come to a party with me? I think it's a kind of world changing moment. Like suddenly she has agency. She suddenly feels mm. she belongs. She's been invited instead of always feeling like she's knocking on doors or, or you know, trying to wave her hands in the air that I'm here, I, I'm listening, I have something to say. Um, and that is also the birth, I think, of their friendship. I think that's when they, they start to share more with each other. Um, they sort of cheer each other on. They become, um, you know, not just sort of entrepreneurs that are both trying to make a splash in a, in a big city, but they start to see that their womanhood their independence. There are so many qualities that they share that are deeply personal. Um, and it allows for a real vulnerability between the two of them. And then that becomes the bedrock of, I think, this sort of unshakable loyalty that Neff carries through. Um, you know, even as the facade starts to crumble, there's something very true that Neff is sure she is tapped into. Um, and no one can really tell her otherwise. I think it's, it's powerful about the two of them. And, and Katie, with your character, you know, she was in this position where she ended up, you know, in huge amount of debt on her company credit card. And what I love about the, the experience of watching that is that as the audience, we never feel like she was a willing participant in handing her card over. And it feels like that's a really important crux of the story for your character. And it's because you're playing her in this way where she has such optimism and such belief in other people. You know, three months after she hasn't been paid back, she still believes that money's gonna be paid back. And yet you still play her as a woman with agency and with intelligence. You know, Thank we you. don't feel like it's naivety. And so how did you find that balance to make sure that the audience were kind of on her side and believed her version of the story and playing her in that way and finding that balance where we didn't see it as just, you know, why would you ever do that we understood yeah. the reasons. Yeah, I it was really important to me that I that people feel like they would have made a very similar decision or at least questioned what they would have done in that situation and for me so much of that came through when we were able to shoot in Morocco because I was actually concerned. I was like I mean, it was there and it was in the script, but Rachel is one of the hardest characters I've ever played. And I, the moment we landed in Morocco when we were at La Mamunia, I understood and was truly able, it was such a gift to be able to shoot there because I really felt like I was able to put myself in someone else's shoes. I, I felt afraid. I felt what she felt when, and when we shot those scenes with a lot of the wonderful actors and with Julia and, and feeling that those fears that you have had as a girl thinking these, these shows locked up abroad, all of these things, you know, you're, I mean, it was such high stakes. Um, and it was actually a really hard place to act for that amount of time. I mean, if you were to look at the scripts, every scene, it either says through tears, sobbing, you know, every scene that Rachel <laughs> has is at a level 10. And she, when she's on the stand and she says the worst thing that has ever happened to her for her, that is true. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to her. And you get to watch a loss of innocence of someone who has, for all intents and purposes, her whole life trusted people and um, has come at people with an open heart. And this is where she learns that not everyone is good and that um, you have to take life in your own hands and make a choice. And she does for better or for worse. But she is forever changed from that incident. And Arian, it feels like so much of the driving factor in your character's connection to this case with, with Anna, you know, it's not just about the professional for him, it's about the personal. And it feels like he almost admires and respects the fact that she was able to not only infiltrate kind of the elite circles, um, but to feel like she was part of it. And, and I was interested in how crucial for you that scene at the beginning of the show was when he's talking to his wife and describing how you know, when they go to parties with her friends, he feels like the valet in the room. You know, he doesn't feel like he, he belongs there. Um, and then how you took a scene like that and really carried that as a lot of his emotional motivations within a lot of scenes throughout the rest of the series. Yeah, um, and yeah, that is so beautifully said. I mean, to be honest with you, um, that's, I'm an immigrant that kind of grew up in that kind of circle a little bit. I grew up in going to neighborhoods that you know i wasn't involved with or my family wasn't involved with and so i understood that so deeply um 
always standing as the outsider and trying to like climb up a ladder of some sort. So in a way that um, really kind of came very natural to me. And honestly, one of the things that I remember Shonda saying is that um, you get, there's such a beat, there's always like, when you play a criminal defense attorney, there's always like, a, oh, one of these guys or whatever. Um, but she said something on the first day that we just kind of like, we're working together. She basically said, he's a good guy. Um, that's really trying to use this case to really like make a name for himself because he's a good lawyer. And so, so much of that upbringing, and he also is married to someone who is, <clears throat> you know, comes from money and power and privilege. And so in a way it's the essential, it's really weird how similar it is to the actual television <laughs> you know, climbing up the ladder as well, because you got to, you know, as he says, fake it till you make it. And so some of what he's doing is that. So I think that was a big crux of how I like started the the work on playing Todd. Yeah. And, and Julia, jumping back to you, you know, I love the way that we gradually get to see more and more cracks in the veneer with Anna as things tighten in on her. Um, you know, and so the first kind of several episodes, she's very on point. She's delivering, you know, all of the truths that she wants to portray to people. And we're really not seeing it in a big way with other people. We're seeing it in really small moments in your performance. You know, she's turns around from someone and we see kind of a flicker in your eyes of like everything that she's processing, yeah. all of the emotions that are going on beneath the surface and then obviously by the time we get to the court trial we're really seeing a lot of that bubble to the surface and so how did you want to kind of take those cracks in the veneer and make them really minute choices at the beginning and then by the end have it things that be things that she's fully expressing on the surface you know living with the mindset of Anna what I realized is Anna's biggest fear is failure and and mm. when I'm saying by failure I mean her biggest fear is really rejection it the, the the fear of rejection is so deep rooted that she is so afraid to be rejected and she's so afraid to fail that she will go to the nth degree to behave in in such a way which is cra crazy sometimes you know uh better better way to put it but I, but i actually feel like it a lot of it has to do with also identity not being comfortable who she is feeling like she's not enough and that she's going to get rejected and that she's uh afraid that she's going to fail um i but i can say i i, I don't want to speak on behalf of every everyone but i feel like so much of this show is about identity and about the fear of failure. Everybody has their own fear of failure on this show of each character um, and deep rooted re rejection. I feel like also that is a very big problem. I feel like in this day and age where people are putting themselves out there so much and their self-esteem is so unhealthy. It's like either here or there and and the fear of of rejection and failure is is so deep. And I feel like um, I just hope that people can take that from this show in a way. I think um, I think Julia, that's the psychological piece. But I think there is there is a there's a political um, aspect for me around the show's themes that really feel like about the American dream. Mm -hmm. I think that Anna, um, in a very, you know specific way comes to America to sort of like live the American dream. And what's interesting and fascinating to me about that is that so many people, you know, have done very much the same things that Anna did, you know, faking financial documents, um, you know, getting loans based on fraudulent, you know, assets, you know, some of those people become the president of the United States and other people end up in jail. And so for me, I think there's this whole thing around like, what does what what constitutes success meritocracy what does that mean and look like for different people from different backgrounds if she were really a german heiress would she have actually gone to jail you know and then her what's so compelling for me about about anna is that she would rather go to jail but have everyone believe that she was really close to succeeding in her goal of getting that loan, of convincing everyone that she was worthy of, um, you know, that $40 million loan for ADF. And that is, the, and that the failure piece, but it is also like this whole, it's the dream. It's the, the dream of, 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 of success in America sort of drives her in this, in this, and I think that drive, everyone is very ambitious in 
in this in this show. I mean, um, Todd's character, um, you know, uh, Alexa, everyone is wanting that sort of redemption, right? That success, Vivian, everyone is looking for that next moment. I think Casey's fine. I don't, I don't know if Casey's looking for that, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but but I I can say this about I feel like with Casey though is that she's also an, uh I don't want to say afraid to get rejected but you know to me she always wants to make sure that everyone's okay and yeah. that is kind of some weird like codependent thing very very subconsciously you know subconsciously in a way so uh, you know with love with love for the real Casey Duke in my preparation, the word codependency certainly came up many times uh, <laughs> with, with a lot of love. Um, for, I, I just have to say, I have such deep respect for Casey. Having spend it, spend, spent a lot of time with her, I feel like if people don't know who she is, she is a legend in the fitness industry. She um, you know, is one of the co-founders of Equinox. She has trained everyone from Lenny Kravitz to Denzel Washington to Julianne Moore to Eve, the list, can BB Rexa, you know, she is a legend in her field who a lot of people don't know and should know and I think we should have a lot of respect and admiration for her and what she's achieved Madonna went to her workout class in the 80s you know <laughs> so Casey Duke is a living legend in the fitness industry and um and she is that because of um the service that she's provided to so many people for nearly 40 years and I, I love that idea that you were both bringing up about that theme of, of fear of failure and Anna and, and Arian, you know, that's so much of the connect between your two characters. They're both at this real kind of professional precipice and the fear of failure drives them so much. Um, and, you know, you take this relationship that's very distant between the two of them and then you bring them to a point where, you know, he's massaging her and kind of like cracking her back for her when she's having pregnancy pains. They're going out to dinner with their spouses, but they're still, you know, watching video clips of Anna the whole time. Um, and so how did you want to build that dynamic between the two of them that builds more and more intimacy, but is kind of interesting because it still always comes back to the intimacy and the connection being talking about Anna and having conversations about her all the time. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, Ariane, I, I think we, we both, we, you know, should probably pop in at some point. Um, but I'll say, yeah, I, um, I think Anna seems to bring people together, you know, Anna Delvey. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that that's possibly, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I love listening to all this because it's just such like, you know, social behaviors is, is fascinating. And, um, you know, when, when we discuss like rejection, it just made me think about how with social media, you're so afraid of being rejected by the people who are immediately close to you that you just cast, like, it, it seems like a lot of people who use social media so much, it's casting the widest net possible so as to hedge your bets the best way um, to assure not being rejected from some tribe, from some, you know, belonging, from some group, right? Um, oh, this group doesn't want me. I've got that group, right? It's, it's, it, it's just really connecting what you said, Julia. It's phenomenal. Um, and that said, yeah, for, for those of us who, who are playing characters who are sort of kind of I, I need to watch my language who are hurt mm -hmm. um, from having been rejected <laughs> um, once or twice. Uh, and we see them and we catch up with them at that point in their lives where they're just like, really, really can't do another one. You know, it's, it, it's so alluring to have a group. It's so alluring to have a connection with somebody, especially when it's unexpected. Um, especially when you feel like you're the only one and maybe that person is the only other one who shares it. So it does remind me of like Rachel Casey and Neff and, you know, they had a group, you know, and, and Anna was the glue weirdly. And, and so, yeah, for Todd and Vivian, Anna is this glue and they're very, they get to be very privy to what they interpret is the real deal with Anna. Right. And everybody feels the same way. They get to have some sort of weird ownership and yet they share it and that brings them together. Um, you know, and so I think that, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we see grow between Vivian and Todd. And, and of course, towards the end, you know, you see them sort of grapple with the idea of, of not having that anymore. And, and they don't know what to do with that. Arian, what do you, I don't know what you want to say. No, I think that's so well said. I mean, so much of what you're saying, um, and what I'm feeling about this question and this, and, and this conversation is that, that Anna does bring people together. And I do think that we, at least for Todd and, and maybe for Vivian, um, there is a little bit of like, 
Well, if a dude did do this, we wouldn't be here. I mean, let's just be real. And so there is an unjust thing that's happening here. And the fact that, you know, um, there the whole book has been thrown at her and every charge under the sun has been thrown at her. There is a way of demonizing someone like that. Um, especially if they've been, she's embarrassed people that might be fancy and rich. Um, I can imagine, you know, cigar conversations with those gentlemen at the 1% being like, she did this to me. Oh, don't worry. I'm going to take care of this. Mm-hmm. So there is so much of that political aspect of it. Laverne, you were talking about that. I really am fascinated mm-hmm. about. And I think, Vivian and Todd, in a way, kind of come together and understand that this is kind of this is kind of not right what's happening here, and so um, that that really brings them closer together. And I think you're right, uh, Anna Klumsky, is that um, is that I think she is a glue. I think you know I would love to hear what Julie has to say, but there's I'm sure she's the life of the party. I'm sure she's like fun and easy, and so I, I don't know. Like there's so much about her that brings all of us together that I think is really fascinating. You know, and with that idea of the fact that she brings people together, you know, Alexis, Laverne and Katie, that friendship group that Anna was mentioning between the three of them is so fascinating to watch all those scenes because there's such a power play dynamic. You know, if Anna's in a good mood, everyone's having a great time. You know, if she's sitting there surly on her phone waiting to hear about her loans, there's a different energy that your characters all have to kind of carry for her. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the dynamic of, of what that is is always led by where Anna is. And so how did you all kind of like look at both Julia's performance and the scripts to kind of really always figure out what that dynamic in those group situations were. It's interesting, like, well, that what I what I would say about that now, having watched the series in its totality, um, obsessively, by the way, when I was in Paris, is that it's the group that ends up in Morocco together because of circumstances is the group that Anna can control the most, right? That like I'm there as a job, right? I'm there as a tra- trainer. Um, we're all people who she can control. And that like, she sort of figured it out and whittled it down to the folks she can control. And unfortunately, these are not people who ha- who can afford, you know, $65,000 on their credit card, no problem. So um, she's sort of in that. So that was what, what was interesting watching it. Being in this space, it was, it was this very... Again, Casey's there to for, for a job, you know? And I think that like for her, it's not unusual for Casey to be flown all over the world to train clients. This, is, this has been her life for decades. And so she's clear about being there to do a job, but then she can be hospitable and she can, you know, make small talk and befriend people and also sort of be, I don't, I don't want to say a mother figure, but like maybe an auntie figure or someone who has a bit more maturity and is able to sort of attempt at least to ground people and give them perspective. Um, but she's there as, you know, performing a service. And in that service, you know, I I have, you know, I just had hair and makeup people here, you know, who I've been working with for years and they like now go out and have coffee together and they like hang out, but like they're doing a job. So there's this right. thing of doing a job but then having camaraderie with coworkers kind of, even though there other people aren't necessarily, everybody was working. Let's just keep it real. Everybody yeah, and was working. she's already in the position of power, you know, she, especially the Morocco episode, she's in the position of power we're there on a trip in a foreign country under the rule that she is paying for all of this you know she invited us on this trip so i think in rachel's case it's very much you know obviously i rachel really wanted to go to the gardens but they didn't <laughs> go because because anna delvey doesn't want to go and isn't paying for that and it isn't only until later that we realize she doesn't want to leave the hotel because the hotel, you can put everything on one card. I t- I t- can I say this? I have to say this. May I say this? And I tested this to Katie. That moment when you are calling about your American, you get on the phone oh. with American Express, girl. Did we all feel that? That Same. was... So I was on the phone impressive. with Spectrum yesterday trying to get some internet. And I, girl, that was so real. Like I was just I anxious for you and scared. And I was, I knew what was going to happen. And I was going through it. That was like so real. 
I'm so like, glad because I no. honestly, you know, I think the oh. whole series takes such a, you know, what's so cool about the writing and about this story. And I think why people are so fascinated by Anna Delvey is because you're, you're in, on one hand, you think it's a Robin Hood story. And yes, like Arian has said, if a dude did this, or there are men who have done so much worse and they're billionaires and they're not in jail. Like, so there's yeah. that side of it. Yeah. And now, and we watch her in the beginning of the series, especially conning not great people or people who are super rich and have extra money to spare. But as soon as it, for me, when I, when I get to the Rachel sections and you are watching a con happen and a person's life fall apart, who isn't rich um, and who isn't a bad person, then all of a sudden things start to I think change. And I think the, the series starts to change. And I think audiences that cool area of a gray zone, where is Anna Delvey good? Is she bad? Is she right? Is she wrong? Is it evil? Is it okay? Like what, what are all of these things? We just get to play in this gray area. I was going to talk about Neff's like the moment that same, like that similar moment when it's like, Oh, like you feel it in your gut, just that thing where you're like, Oh, life is dandy. And then you're like, why is this affecting me so much? Like, why is this possible um, lie hurting so much? And that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Which half moment was that for you, Anna? Do you want to just finish that real quick? I'm curious. I was, ta- I was referring to like, it was when we start to see the human cost basically and the emotional and human cost. I, I mm. really, you know, you start to, I felt like you, you really, it really drives home in um, when we watch Neff go through um, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, whether, whether she's paying or not moment. And it's, it's, I don't know, there's, it's beautiful. It's, we think that it's here and then it goes, Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. And, yeah. and I'm so sorry. We could, I'd love to listen to you guys talk about this all day, but no, we have to wrap up so you can jump into other calls. Um, thank you so much. Congratulations on the season. Thank it's you. Really fantastic. Mm. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Bye. Bye.